I mean, all of these wrongful conviction cases, ultimately the system works. People do want to tell their stories. You break the law, there are consequences. Hello. Hello. Welcome to True Crime and Consequences. I'm Kari. And I'm Brian. And we're a husband and wife team who are pretty much just sitting around shooting the shit about one of my favorite topics on earth, and that would be true crime. Um, Little background, I've been obsessed with true crime since I was about 13. Um, Started with the West Memphis 3 case, ironically the first case we're going to cover. Or not ironically, it was chosen by design. (laughs) But um, anyway, yeah, so I've been fascinated with the whole subject of true crime for the majority of my life. And for those of you who aren't aware, although I don't think there's anyone on Earth not aware, we're all kind of stuck in quarantine right now because of the dreaded coronavirus. Kind of scary, kind of weird. I'm 40 years old. I've never experienced anything like this. So I was bored and having anxiety, which I'm sure a lot of you guys out there are. And my husband suggested, Brian over here, that we should do a podcast about stuff I'm interested in because it would give me something to do. And give me something to do it has. I mean, how many hours have I put into this now? I don't know. Good solid week. Well, I took a like day and a half off. So, but it was about three to four hours a day of research in a week and a half. And I took like a day and a half off. So do the math. That's, it's a lot. It's a lot of documentary watching, researching online, that kind of thing. But it's a lot of fun. And it it kept my mind occupied, which is what I really, really needed right now. So anyway, um, So here we are doing this podcast, and one of the things I really want to focus on is wrongful convictions or alleged wrongful convictions, because it's just not something that you really hear about a lot other than the big... The major documentaries. The big cases, like the West Memphis Three, like Making a Murderer, like those types of cases are, you know, focused on because, you know, Netflix gave them a deal, HBO gave them a deal what have you. But there's also, for every one case like that, there's thousands of cases just like it, sometimes even more egregious, that nobody knows about. So um, to give you an idea of why I think this topic is so important, I pulled some information from the Innocence Project, which is a nationwide nonprofit that helps Specifically in wrongful conviction cases, and uh, most of them have focused on DNA exonerations. And for those of you who don't know what that means, that means that an alleged perpetrator was convicted of a crime sometime in the past, and it usually averages about 15 to 20 years ago. And over the course of time, new evidence is found or old evidence is retested using the most modern DNA technology. and Guess what? Person sitting in prison for the last however many years didn't do it. Didn't do it. Exactly. So uh, I'm just going to throw some stats out real quick just so you guys get a really good understanding of why this is so important to me and why this is so important to shine a light on these stories and give these, I mean, let's be real, these, these alleged perpetrators are victims. And they're victims of not only the actual criminal that committed the crime that they've been convicted of. But more importantly, they're a victim of our incredibly flawed judicial system. So since 1989, there have been 367 DNA exonerees in 37 states. Um, Now, to throw out one more stat that I've heard from several uh, or read in several sources is that there's an estimation out there that about 300 people are potentially wrongly convicted every year in this country alone. Now, that is just an estimate, but given what I've seen and what I've heard and a lot of the stats here, I I 
am kind of inclined to think that's a possibility. So all these cases that you, you cited here, or you've got numbers for here, mm-hmm. they were due to DNA? DNA. They're DNA exonerations. So in cases where they didn't have any DNA evidence, we could still have oh, oh, innocent people hundreds, in if not prison, thousands. but not cleared. Well, right now, we have 2.2 million people incarcerated in the United States of America alone. 2.2 million people. We have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. Wow. And they are disproportionately people of color. I mean, it, it's the, the numbers are staggering. But anyway, um, the average time served for a DNA exoneree is 14 years. But that's the average. So you're going to have anywhere from, you know, six months to 20, 30, in some cases, 40 years. Well, I would think that uh, most of them are going to be older cases because DNA the majority, wasn't yeah. able to be tested at the time. but Or... or DNA, or like in the West Memphis 3 case, DNA was in its infancy at the time. So it the technology just wasn't the way it is now. Right. So they needed mass quantities of of material to be able to even run DNA in, you know, the 90s. But now you you can have the most minuscule amount and at least get some sort of a result. Yeah, now you can go back through all those cases and look it up. But like I said... If, if of course, the if local was. judicial system wants to do that and... The if evidence. the evidence even exists still, right. or ever existed at all. Out of those 367 exonerees since 1989, again, DNA exonerees, 21 of those people were on death row. 21 people that would have died in prison. And some of whom did. I don't have the numbers. Um, that wasn't so, something I could find. Some of them were exonerated. After, After they were executed. Oh, wow. wow. Because the family was pushing. Or someone else, in a couple cases that I heard of, someone else confessed to the crime. After the original supposed perpetrator was executed, and the family of the person who was executed pushed to have it reinvestigated based on that confession... And the DNA subsequently matched the person that made the confession. If only you could convict that person of the original crime and mm. the murder of the. But he, that, but that <laughs> person didn't commit the murder. The state did. I know, but so if any, if you want to convict could have prevented somebody, it. The state, well, sure. <laughs> Out of those three hundred and sixty-seven people, forty-one people pled guilty. We'll get into why that is in other episodes. Those are known as false confessions. And we will talk about that at length. Not right now. 69% of those involved eyewitness identification. Well, that's already been established to be flawed. I have a whole bunch of stats on how that breaks down in percentages of that percentage, but I don't necessarily want to go into it. But we're talking about stuff like voice recognitions, composite sketches, lineups, photo lineups. Those kinds of things. Um, they eighty five percent of that sixty nine percent were surviving victim misidentification cases. Oh, so somebody who, okay, but yeah, still, it's eyewitness identification has been proven time and time again to be fatally flawed. But it's the most convincing to a jury. Oh, sure, because it's an, it's emotional stuff, and we'll get into that too. And Every single case we cover, because that tends to be one of the, uh, I want to say symbiotic, but I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it's its the great equalizer of all these cases is that you almost always have some sort of misidentification from some kind of either an eyewitness or an ear witness or something to that effect where emotion comes into play and then the emotion transfers to the jury. Yeah, it's great for and in the some jury cases the judge because some people choose to have judge only trials. They waive their right to a jury trial and ask a judge to to hear it. You know, judges are human too. Yeah. So it's like they have emotions too. They have preconceived ideas just like any other human being. So, I mean, is it is it better maybe to have just one person making the decision over twelve? I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess I'm it, not sure. I guess it depends on the merits of the case. You know, if it's something sure. that's going to be 
less concrete evidence but more emotional, you're probably slightly advantageous to go with the judge only because yeah, think, they're yeah. they're trained in the law that are trained to know what's real. Well, and they real. usually, most judges spent years and years and years as lawyers prior right. to being a judge. So it, but I the, think all judges. The actually. jury is going to be much more likely to be swayed by. Well, because they're just really, regular people just like you and me who are ruled by their emotions 95% of the time. Um, 44% of the six, 367 exonerees involved forensic science mistakes. 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 By experts or in collecting? Or... I think that's kind of across the board. Is, is it, it encompasses all of that oh, okay. based on what I could tell. Um, so you would have mistakes in, in how the evidence was handled. You'd have officers losing evidence. You'd have, you know, the scientists running the tests wrong, which happens a lot. I mean, it's not... Like anything run by humans, it's going to have human flaws. Right. And that includes a lab because it's all about who's handling it. And that's also something we'll talk about in one of the other cases we're covering. Uh, 28% of those involved false confessions. Now, that is a topic we're going to get deep into in our first case and probably every case after that because it's a huge problem. 49% of those false confessions were given by someone under 21 years of age. 33% were given by people 18 years old and younger. And 10% had mental health and capacity issues. Yeah, I think we'll talk a, about that in yeah. depth in our first case, because I'm covering in case you haven't figured it out, I'm covering the West Memphis three case. And if I didn't already say that, and, uh, we know for a fact that there were severe mental defects going on in the person that they interrogated and subsequently got a false story out of. So 17% involved informants. Now that's very similar to eyewitness identification because also they have something to gain. Always, always. Don't ever let them tell you they don't have something to gain. Oh, the worst are the jailhouse informants. Put them in a cell while they're waiting trial with somebody. And he's yep. a jailhouse informant, and then they get something out of getting saying that they got a confession. I have no respect for snitches so. anyway, but when it's that type of situation where they clearly they've been offered something, they've been manipulated or offered something by law enforcement to roll on someone or to narc on someone, and like you, you're the lowest of the low person if you're doing something like that. Yeah, but you no, know, I mean, I, but some of those people that are that turn into snitches, they're in there for a reason. Oh, sure, they're not the the falsely, jailhouse informants for sure. They're already yeah. there because they did something well, and wrong. People on the outside, some of those do too. But oh yeah, like they're told that um, if you rat out this person, we won't press charges against you for whatever we just picked your ass up for. Right, you know that happens a lot too. So 267 of those exonerees have been compensated in some way. However, I just read a story yesterday. A guy spent 23 years in prison and got $50. And they count that as compensation. Ooh. <laughs> I know, right? He's rich now. Rich now. Go have a meal on us. Sorry take for your, your trouble. Take your family to Applebee's. Have a nice night. 50 bucks, he won't get his whole family <laughs> fed at Applebee's. Oh, I was thinking like maybe his <laughs> wife and like one kid or something. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, but uh, that all, that goes up to millions of dollars. I mean, it just depends on the state and, and what the, how long they were in and the egregiousness of the state's actions and getting them convicted in the first place. I mean, there's a whole lot of, of crap that goes into an exoneree getting some kind of compensation. But that also means there's over 100 exonerees who are still fighting to get compensated or who have never and will never get compensated. And that's crap because every person who's been convicted of a crime and has been proven to have not committed that crime deserves every dime they can squeeze out of that. I, that, I think they deserve some restitution for the... the bulk of their life being taken away in well, a lot yeah. of cases. Well, yeah, and from their family. I mean, that not only did their life get taken away from them, it got taken away from their families and their friends and their whoever else they have in, the, you know, their jobs, whatever they have going on in their life, they were taken from it. Sometimes for decades and decades, decades. I mean, that that deserves 
no amount of money is going to fix that. No amount of money is going to replace it, but it certainly gives them a leg up once they get out so that they can start functioning in society instead of the usual story you hear where they get released and then they're struggle busting it sometimes for years. Yeah. You know, where they can't get a job because, you know, for some people, they never escape the stigma. Even if it's proven they didn't do it, they never escape the stigma. No, they're just, in a lot of cases, they'd be just as hard off as the the guy who did do something and got exactly. released from prison. I mean, we and have, the same we stigma have and... do we not, personal experience with that. Yeah. With one of our friends yeah. who was convicted of a crime and he finally got out of prison. Now, it wasn't a wrongful conviction, but he got out of prison and the community wouldn't accept him back, even though he'd been a part of this community for his entire life. And so what happened? He fell back into old patterns because no one would give him a shot. Now, he's fine now. I'm not naming names. He's fine now. Has his own business and a wife and he's doing good. But it, there's a stigma that just follows you when you've been in prison for anything. I don't care what you were in for. If you've been in prison and you're on parole, which was the case with our friend, or even if you've been fully exonerated, there's a stigma that you cannot escape. And even if you move to a whole different state, you still have a record. Yeah. You know, because even when you're exonerated, the record doesn't disappear. Not completely. Well. All it takes is you apply for a job and your new boss Googles you. Right. The The actual criminal record. The criminal record goes away. But the, but the. Which means you can put on your. You don't have to put on your uh, application that you're a felon. No, but that doesn't change that they but, can Google you. Right. And they're going to see that. And that is going to whether whether they admit it or not or whether they even want it to or not. It's going to affect how they view you. And I mean, and, and some people maybe deserve that, but most people don't, I think, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Most. Yeah. Well, there's. Yeah, I guess it depends on. I mean, if you're a serial rapist, they're probably not going to let you out of prison anyway. But if you're a serial rapist and they let you out, you deserve the stigma. It depends on the circumstances. If you're somebody who's constantly in and out, you've proven that you can't actually go straight. Then you can't function in normal society. Then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you. If you find the guy's got a rap sheet that's really, really long, then yeah, you probably. Of course, you'd still have to look more deeply into that rap sheet and figure out like were these actually, you know, violent crimes or were they petty? I know. I'm just saying that there are some cases where it's probably warranted. Right, but for the majority of people, either they're if they're out, they've either done their time and served their debt to society, or they've been exonerated of what they were originally accused of. And at that point, they don't deserve any stigma, but it still happens. Yeah, they they definitely don't. Right. Um, 189 of the DNA exonerees all had help from the Innocence Project. So the Innocence Project came in, went to bat for them, and succeeded in proving their cases. So, so 180-something? 189 of so the... So about half? Well, hold on, let me for back one moment. So out of the 367 DNA exonerees to date, 189 of them had direct help from the Innocence Project. A little more than half. Yeah. The other half had to do it on their own. Well, sort of. I mean, they don't typically do it on their own, but they didn't have help from a national organization that focuses only on this. So yeah. So it would have been more difficult for sure because they would have had their families would have had to come up with money, money hire new attorneys, all those resources. hire all the investigation or investigators, like private investigators and stuff. They get utilized a lot in wrongful conviction cases. Um out of all of those, 162 of the actual assailants have been identified. Oh, well, that's good. So that's that's really I mean that's a little over half. So or around half. The right person is actually the right the person time. is in jail now. Out of those 162 actual assailants, those same perpetrators went on to be convicted of a total of 152 violent crimes, including 82 sexual assaults, 35 murders, and 35 other violent crimes while the exonerees were sitting in prison for their crime. 
all of which could have been prevented if they had gone for the right person the first time. 152 violent crimes, including rape and murder, could have been avoided had the police broadened their investigations and done their actual job. Not focused on this guy because we can get him. But it's always tunnel vision. I watch enough ID. I've read enough books. I mean, I, I spent my younger years absorbing every Anne Rule book I could get my hands on. If you don't know who Anne Rule is, she's an incredibly famous true crime writer, actually from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, she's from Washington State. And she has kind of an interesting story herself um, of she actually worked with Ted Bundy in Seattle for a while when he was still normal and living in Seattle, or pre presumably well. normal, living in Seattle working for a crisis hotline. She worked with him closely and liked him a lot. And they were, they were I mean, quote unquote friends, you know, and uh, she was shocked when he was arrested in Florida. Didn't believe it at first. But then she talked to him and he confessed. If anyone's interested in the book called The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule, and it's a fascinating read if you're interested in uh, true crime or serial killers or you just think Ted Bundy's cute or like, I don't know, just if you're interested, it's a great book. Also, I have a personal connection to Anne Rule. A friend of mine I went to high school with, her grandfather used to be a detective for the Corvallis Police Department, which is a city that I, which is the city I grew up in, in Oregon. He's actually been, well, I'd say featured. I mean, you're, you can be featured in a book, right? Like she, he was featured as, because she had worked with him uh, writing some of her books because he had investigated numerous crimes in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because... My, uh, we're sitting in our room here and the sun is at the worst possible angle and it's right in Brian's eyes and he got this really hilarious look on his face. Yeah, it's gone right between this last of the blinds. So, so uh, hey, at least it's beautiful outside and it's not raining anymore. So anyway, the point being 152 violent crimes could have been avoided if the police had just done their job like they were supposed to and gotten the right guy, person. I, I'm not going to assume it's men, but the right person. Um, obviously, out of the 367 exonerees, 225 of them were African-American. Uh. That is 61%. For those of you who can't do the math in your head like myself, that's insane. When I said earlier that this crap disproportionately affects people of color, I was not lying. Like, it, it's blatantly obvious that race plays a part in 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 the judgment of law enforcement across the board not just the police but police judges juries all of them it would definitely appear so <laughs> yeah it's it's not okay so 130 of those exonerees were convicted of murder 40 of them from eyewitness identification 81 of them from false confessions do you see why this is a huge problem huge Huge problem. I cannot adequately express how big a problem this is and how this exact thing, this, this, these DNA exonerees are just a handful of examples of how enormous this problem is. And on top of that, I don't even have stats for how many of these people were executed for the crimes they did not commit because I don't know that they actually know. And as long as there's the risk of an innocent person, I mean, anyone, how many did I say were on death row? Remind me, I can't remember now. I thought it was 20s. 21. 21 of them were on death row. Any, uh, any one of those people could have been killed by the state at any time, knowing that they were innocent. And now, and us knowing now that they were innocent. And as long as that's even a thing, as long as there's even a chance that an innocent person could be put into the death chamber for a crime they didn't commit, then capital punishment, the death sentence, needs to end. Because it's not, I mean, we're, we're, we're murdering people. The state, we're allowing the states to murder people. When they really aren't sure. More importantly, we can extrapolate from those figures 
that for years and years and years, we've been executing a fair number of innocent people. Oh, for sure. Because this is, you know, fairly recent. This is very recent information. But, yeah. I mean, this is probably a list compiled in the last 15 to 20 years. Good bet that there were a lot of people that over the years that had been. Yeah. As an example with the case we're going to cover first, the West Memphis 3 case. Damien Eccles spent 18 years, 76 days, or 78 days, 76, somewhere in there. 18 years <laughs> in prison, on death row, at the verge of being murdered at any time for something he didn't do. So the fact that that is even something we need to talk about disgusts me. I mean, we shouldn't have to sit here and say, oh, the death penalty should be abolished because there's too many innocent people being executed. Yeah. You know, I mean, it that shouldn't even be a topic of discussion because it shouldn't be happening, is my point. Yeah. So sitting here having to say, okay, here, here's why I want to focus. I mean, the, the, do you understand now why with that list, why it's so important to me to put a focus and, and shine a light on the whole issue of wrongful convictions? Like, does that give you an even better idea as someone who doesn't know this stuff because you're not as into true crime as I am? You're more like one of our audience members who just maybe wants to listen for shits and giggles. Yeah, it, it makes sense. That's why when we've talked in the past, just in our own personal life, when I've talked about it and I've been so passionate about it, is this, this is why. Because that can't continue. And I know that our judicial system is fatally flawed because it's a human-created system. So, of course, it has flaws. But as long as those flaws exist and as long as they're... I mean, because how do you fix it, though? That's the thing. You can't really fix the system insofar as it's still run by human beings and they are still emotional creatures and they are still going to make bad decisions and you're still going to have bad actor police officers and investigators and district attorneys and whatnot. Those are those things are never going away. They just exist within humanity. So you can't get rid of that. What you can do in the interim is get rid of the death penalty so that at least these people who've been convicted and cl have claimed all along that they didn't do it, continue to have time to make it right, to prove that they were innocent. Because if you kill them, you're out of time. Yeah, they were, yeah. And how do you, I don't understand why it's even still a thing when, how do these district attorneys and these judges and these police officers explain when it comes out after execution? especially oh sorry our bad i it, mean like what what is uh, they were just doing money. their job here's that's what money. they always say we were just doing our job we followed what the evidence told us and it told us it was him and then he confessed he confessed because you manipulated him into confessing but that's a whole nother but that's thing you know in their yeah. opinion they're just doing their job i know and i understand that most of them are, are good people and most of them are just doing their job however there is a small group of law enforcement in every community well, that are not good people. Well, and and the truth is they all have a drive to close the case. And, and the, I understand that completely. The detectives need to close the case because somebody's right in their butt. Right. And then the prosecutors need to win the cases because that's Well, and like when you have a murder job. that's so egregious, like the West Memphis 3 case with the three little boys, there's a huge amount of public outcry especially when it's kids. I mean, there's I've never seen a level of emotion within just an entire community as I see every time I watch any story that involves the murder of a child. I mean, it's just it's it brings out this primal need for retribution, not justice, retribution. Right. There's there's that and then when you combine that mm. with with uh how to, how to say it but uh, maybe the police have a bad opinion of these boys. They don't, you know. You mean the boys they 
they tagged for it? The ones, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, well, these 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 are the bad kids in town. Nobody's really going to miss them. Or, or we if we're talking about a completely different on. case with like different children involved, then you have, you know, they maybe there's some guy they don't like in town. And so they're just like, oh, well, this is a good way to get rid of that, you know, bad actor because. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. there have been lots of cases that they have been known for that kind of stuff oh, through the yeah. years where it's just like. Well, I mean, look at the the old South in the days. Oh, this person was murdered. Grab a black guy off the street and and hang him. Hang him. We could talk about. We don't care who did it. Just I mean, we could talk about. Somebody's got to pay. How many young African American males? I mean, and I'm talking young, like twelve, thirteen years old, were hung. You know, early early on in our history, because you know, some little white girls got assaulted, and. That little African American kid just happened to be, you know, walking by. Oh, it was him. And they just hang him right there. I mean, they don't even give him a chance to defend himself or his family to defend him. No, it's just they string him up right now. I mean, and that was old, old school justice. We're talking like tombstone level. How did you put it the other Probably day? Back in that. I know, but how did you put it the other day? Like, do whatever and let God sort it. What did Kill you say? Kill them all and let God sort it out. Kill them all and let God sort it out, yeah. And that was the mentality back, you know, in the 17, 1800s. Yeah. And if we get it wrong, God will yeah, sort God it out. God will sort it out, yeah. Which, I mean, I can understand. Uh, we're talking about Wild West shit here. And I understand it was harder back then. I mean, it's not like they had forensic anything in the 1700s but or eight, in early 1800s. But although then again, they kind of did. Actually, because there was forensic stuff that they did, like in the um, in the Ripper case, in the Jack the Ripper case, there was yeah. forensic stuff. There's forensic stuff. So I guess that you didn't have. So depending on where you were, I mean, if you're in the the West, you don't. There was really a lot have, less. You yeah. don't have resources. You don't have highly Scotland trained Yard, people. Scotland Yard had a lot more education and and uh, access to science and and stuff that you know the Wild West didn't have. But, but still, it, you know, it. But yeah, I mean, Old West justice doesn't work anymore. Because it was an unfair system to begin with. You know, again, like kill them all, let God sort it out. How does that, that, no, that doesn't work. I'm a Christian and I know that doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, that's not what they actually <laughs> said, but that was I kind know, of the attitude. but that was the attitude. No, that was the attitude. Like someone steals a horse, what'd they do? They like, Hang they up. hung him from like the rafter of the nearest bar or something in front of everyone. Well. And it was just stealing a horse. It's not like he murdered someone's daughter or something. He stole a freaking horse. Like. Technically, the the legal process still applied, and the the hanging would be done by a well, like, actual I was fascinated. hangman at a gallows. I was really, but, really fascinated when I read about. Um, but there was a bunch well, of frontier justice where they didn't even get to a court. Oh well, so. yeah. But I remember reading, you know, because after we watched the TV show Deadwood, I don't know who else is familiar with that show, but it was a rad show on HBO. It was only on for three seasons. They finally did a wrap up movie last year that was really rad. But um, when uh, Wild Bill got got killed in real life not in the tv show and that that guy i can't even think of his name now was there was a whole like criminal proceeding like they had a whole trial and a jury oh well, yeah we've had yeah. the laws and the, it's not like the whole court system no it was just been... different for the time because the uh, deadwood was a lawless town i mean they weren't actually even a town they were just a mining camp they weren't so, even a territory yet. right exactly this was pre what is it? it was South Indian, Dakota? South was, Dakota? Yeah. It was Indian land they were squatting yeah, on. Exactly. So it was like interesting when I read about it. Um, after seeing it on the show, I was like, oh, I'm curious about this. So I looked it up and yeah, there was a whole it was a whole thing. And then he ended up going to a different city that was actually a city in North Dakota, I think. I can't remember now. And got like officially convicted and and all that. But they had a whole trial like in Deadwood. It was cool. I don't know. It was just interesting to read about because you're so used to seeing all the old Western movies and TV shows where they have, like, there's no law. You know, like Tombstone, there's no law and this and that. Because it was a mining camp, not a, not a town. Law? I know. It was just interesting. It's interesting to, uh, history, legal history, if, if you're interested in that sort of thing, is really, really interesting. Because there's, first of all, there's all kinds of crazy laws still on the books that most people don't even know are still on the books and they break every day. There's a bunch of interesting ones in Oregon. If you ever are curious, um, audience, look up laws in your city or your county or whatever that are old and are still technically on the books but aren't enforced anymore because some of them are hilarious. 
I can't remember what town or state it was in, but there's one about not being allowed to walk your goat after midnight or something. I mean, it would literally it's a law. So it's just fun. Anyway, I'm always I wanted to be a lawyer. If if anyone is really curious, I really, really wanted to be a lawyer. I'd wanted to be a lawyer since I was about nine. And so that's when I I kind of started watching legal shows and teaching myself things. And I started watching a lot of court TV. And that is how I saw the initial like West Memphis three coverage. And then, of course, uh, the OJ Simpson coverage. I watched every single day really? of the OJ every single day wow. of the OJ Simpson trial. That was a long ass trial. I didn't watch any of it. Whatever happened every, to be on the news. Every single day I watched the O.J. Simpson trial. It was a fascinating trial. I watched every single day of, of both Michael Jackson trials. I, wa- like, I, f- I find this stuff fascinating. And when you grow up wanting to be a lawyer, it's even more fascinating because you're learning. So, I mean, just from watching court proceedings, because in the O.J. Simpson trial, the cameras never stopped rolling. The second they walked into that courtroom to the second they walked out, the cameras were rolling and it was on court TV. So it was just as someone who wanted to be a lawyer, it was just completely fascinating and almost awe inspiring to watch how these lawyers work and and to watch how they thought. And to I mean, like I had mad respect for Judge Ito, like he just seemed like a cool kid. That was the O.J. Simpson judge for those not in the know. But it was just a fascinating trial. And then I watched the West Memphis three trial or at least. Court TV didn't cover the whole entire thing. It covered snippets, but I watched all the snippets. So it was just, that is kind of, it just made me even more interested in the law, even more interested in being a lawyer. And uh, then I very quickly realized that school was not for me. (laughs) When I was in high school, I was like, you know what? School's not my jam, yo. If you don't want to go to school, you ain't going to be a lawyer. I had to do eight more years of school after... To get to where I wanted to be, I would have had to do eight more years of school. And I was like, uh, F this. So clearly I'm not a lawyer, but (laughs) clearly. But um, I do have a lot of knowledge. Um, I did take some law classes when I attempted to go to school. So it was, you know, so it's like I have some knowledge. And then, of course, I do tons and tons of research all the time about all different cases, not just not just the West Memphis three case and stuff. That's just what I've been focusing on now because that's what we're going to be talking about. But there's all kinds of true crime information swirling around in this brain. Our TV rarely goes off of ID. And Oxygen. I watch Oxygen too when they're doing their true crime specials. But There's, there's an ID logo burned into the corner of our plasma screen. It's because it's a plasma TV. <laughs> and for about two years, the ID logo was completely solid which left a burn-in mark on the TV. Okay. I'm never going to hear the end of that. But I learn a lot from watching ID. So, you know, I do. It's fun. I like ID. If you like ID, rad. Friend me on Facebook. Kari Athena Current. But anyway, um, so that's kind of why we're here. We're going to just be doing this. We're going to be, only it'll be less scattered in the future, but we're going to be doing this. We're just going to be sitting here talking about Cases that um, initially are just ones that I I know the best and I find interesting, and then we'll branch out into lesser known cases. And then I would ultimately like to branch out to, you know, doing fun uh, serial killer ones, like featuring serial killers every once in a while, because I've always found those fascinating as well. And I know you have, too, at least some of them. Some of them. Um, And then... uh, my son kind of our son wants to get involved at some point, but he has no interest in true crime. However, he does have a morbid fascination with the paranormal. And there are numerous cases where paranormal stuff kind of came into play during the defense. So I figure he could help us with with those because he he'd like to help, but it's not really his jam. But if I get him one that has paranormal in there, then he can help me. So um, and then ultimately, I have some friends. Um, that I've made online over the years who have been directly involved with some of the cases I want to talk about, um, have some cases of their own that they'd like to talk about. So eventually I would like to maybe try to Skype them in or or somehow bring them into the conversation so that they can kind of reveal their stories and maybe talk about things that are 
that even I don't know about, you know, on any level. So that could be really fun, I think, for the audience. Yeah, it would work. I don't know, audience, what do you think? Leave in the comments below on YouTube. <laughs> I'm like, there are no comments on the podcast. No, but there's well, comments on there the are YouTube. On some, some there's platforms. comments on the YouTube. So if you're if you're listening to this on YouTube, leave your comments below. If you're not, you can find our channel on YouTube and yes, leave a comment there. And leave a comment there. Or you can find us on Facebook on the True Crime and Consequences Facebook page. Um, let's see, the Twitter. I have a Twitter. True Crime and Consequences Twitter. I believe it's at T C and C podcast. So, you know, give us some feedback. Let us know. What do you guys want to hear? What do you, you know, do you what do you have cases that happened in your family, maybe, or in your friend group that you feel needs some attention? I am more than happy to help out anyone I can. Um, I would love to try to help out active cases. So if there is anybody out there who has a friend or a family member who is claiming to be wrongfully convicted or just got a bum deal because you don't always have to be wrongfully convicted to get a bum deal. Yeah, you can be like over sentence. Well, yeah, I mean, I I don't know if anybody I'm sure a lot of our audience knows that Kim Kardashian West has gotten really involved in the legal system. She's helped overturn some convictions. She's working on uh, criminal justice reform. She is studying to be a lawyer and should be taking her bar within the next year or two. Um, and so she's going to be a lawyer and she wants to focus on wrongful convictions and, you know, things like excessive sentencing and mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines and things like that are completely unfair. She did a special actually last last weekend, I think, that was incredibly interesting. And it was talking about basically, does the does the punishment fit the crime? You know, she helped free a woman who had gotten a life. Was it? Li I actually took notes on it because I found it so interesting. But one of the cases she worked on was like the lady had gotten life plus 20 years or some crap for a first offense nonviolent drug crime. Life? Life. Wow. Got her out after 20 some odd years. I can't remember how long it was. What was she like transporting two tons of No, coke? she was a phone mule. She didn't even have the drugs in her possession. She was just a phone mule. What's a phone mule? Um, you know what? They defined it on the show and I can't remember, but it's basically she she used her phone to facilitate transport deals. But that was it. She didn't do drugs. She didn't sell drugs. She just used her phone to facilitate the deals. Must have been a lot of deals. It was. But you want to know what they ended up doing, though? They tagged her as the ringleader. Oh, that explains why they gave her life. Yeah. Life plus like 20 years or some shit for a first offense nonviolent drug crime. And the only reason she started doing it is her son had just died. And she desperately needed money. It's the only reason she did it. Wow. Well, President Trump commuted her sentence. Ah, okay. Yeah. Kim went to Washington. Kim Kardashian goes to Washington. And she succeeded, which I thought was rad as hell. That title sounds like a cheesy movie. As well, as, well I was like, Mr. <laughs> Smith goes to Washington. There's like some old movie with Jimmy Stewart that wasn't really my jam, but my grandparents liked that sort of thing. So I was raised by my grandparents, so I watched a lot of old movies. A lot. So, yeah, anyway, so that's why we're here. That's what we're doing. Um, we're going to focus on wrongful convictions initially and then kind of branch out to do other things, but continue with the wrongful conviction trend because I just personally, in my heart, feel that it's really important to shine a light on these cases and give you know, give these people a voice that they might not otherwise have. Now, I realize the first couple cases I'm going to do are incredibly publicized, already covered a million ways cases, but I'm doing it because A, I find them interesting. B, I think they're good examples of how the, all these things that cause wrongful convictions can go wrong. And they're the ones I'm most comfortable with for doing a brand new podcast is something I've never done before. So I wanted to do something that I knew because that way it would give me good practice. Right. You you already know most of the information. You just had to flesh out the details and make notes. to Even, even I have 50, let's see, even though I have 55 pages of notes, most of it I already knew, which was helpful. 
I was just able to flesh out little tiny details and a few bombshells that came out recently, which was fun to find out about. But anyway, so we are going to be doing the West Memphis three case next or first, I should say. And that's going to be really fun. We should probably be recording it uh, sometime next week and then we'll have it up probably the week after. So expect that to drop in about two weeks, maybe less. I don't know. We'll see. Um, it's probably going to be a multi-parter. So expect at least three episodes, if not more. I'm hoping not more, but it might be more. I don't know. It just depends on how long it takes us to really flesh it out. But um, and after that, I'm going to do the making a murderer case. And then after that, it is anyone's game. So again, please go to my our Twitter. Please go to Facebook. Please go to Instagram. It's we're on there, too. Um, comment down below if, if you're on YouTube and let us know, like, are there cases that you're interested in hearing about? Because, you know, I do this because I'm interested in it, but I want to please our audience, too. So if there's anything they really, really want to know about, I'm more than happy to cover it. We'll list the links to the social media sites and the YouTube channel in the description for the video or for the podcast. Yep, they'll all be there. So, it'll you know, you're one click away from making your suggestions. And we hope you enjoy this and we hope you have as much fun as I hope we will making them. And you guys have a great evening and we will see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Ultimately, the system works. Consequences. <laughs>